Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and you made it to the final lecture in this series. In this lecture series, we went through essentially the entire nursing pharmacology curriculum. So whether you're here as a nursing student, getting ready for the NCLEX, or getting ready for nurse practitioner school, I hope you found this series to be helpful. In this final video, we're gonna go through some autoimmune diseases and their related medications, as well as some miscellaneous medications that we didn't get a chance to discuss in any previous lecture. Let's begin as we always do with a pathophysiology review. There's a broad category of diseases called autoimmune diseases, and a number of these are specifically inflammatory diseases, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna begin with rheumatoid arthritis. We're also gonna talk about gout, Gout is a buildup of uric crystals in the joints. This is another type of arthritis. Osteoarthritis, which again is another type of arthritis. And if you're interested, if you're learning this also in a med surge class, there's really cool charts out there that specifically delineate RA versus OA and how to tell the symptoms, which ones get better throughout the day, which ones get worse throughout the day, which ones are bilateral versus unilateral, larger joints versus smaller joints, and so on and so forth. In discussing each of these diseases in relation to pharmacology, all of these begin with NSAIDs. We start with treating them with NSAIDs such as ibuprofen or naproxen, and that's the foundation of treatment for these diseases. Osteoporosis is a little bit different. Osteoporosis is caused by a decrease in bone mass, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this disease at the end. But let's go ahead and let's jump right into rheumatoid arthritis. So for RA, the first thing we do is we go to our NSAID, such as ibuprofen or proxen, or we have another one that we do use for this. It's called celecoxib or Celebrex, which we discussed in a previous lecture, and this is really where it's used a lot. So if we're moving on from NSAIDs for any number of reasons, they're not effective, or we just don't want to tolerate the adverse effects that come from long-term NSAID use, we may go to one of these three medications. The first three drugs we have listed here are methotrexate, sulfsalazine, and hydroxychloroquine. Now, current guidelines in mid-2023, we do not have a clear first choice winner, so it's gonna be up to the rheumatologist which medication they have a preference for based on the patient's individual characteristics. Let's go through each of these. Methotrexate is actually used for um, a number of different things, including cancer and induction of an abortion. However, in this case, we're talking about using it for RA. In RA, we don't actually know its mechanism of action of how it helps the patient with RA, but it does. All three of these medications that we're listing here all have an onset of several weeks, and none of these are going to give the patient immediate relief. This is one of the drugs that is often used as first line. Again, there is no clear first line agent. This drug is definitely teratogenic. As mentioned previously, we do actually use this to induce abortions in certain patient populations. This drug has many different varied adverse effects, and we discussed this more in the hematology oncology lecture. Next, we also have the 5-aminosalicylates as a drug class, and that includes sulfsalazine. Sulfsalazine um, is a anti-inflammatory. It's used for several autoimmune diseases, such as UC, ulcerative colitis, and RA. It does have some adverse effects, such as GI effects and blood dyscrasies. And again, the onset takes several weeks. The next one as well, hydroxychloroquine. We discussed this in the infectious disease lecture as a medication for the treatment and prevention of malaria, but it is also used as an autoimmune disease drug, specifically for RA. And again, it takes several weeks. This is generally our go-to next agent. And some of these are often referred to as DMARDs or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. However, if these don't work, we can also move on to monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies, we've discussed this previously, is a very broad class of drugs, and it's used for everything from COVID to RA to asthma and so much more. Two of the drugs that we would use in this class specifically for RA are Atenercept or Adalimumab, which is Enbrel and Humira. These drugs are biologic agents, and the mechanism of action varies by medication. Nearly all, if not all, monoclonal antibodies are by injection only. They're given parenterally. And as we said, these drugs have many different uses. However, today we're going to stick to the uses relating to RA. This drug, just like the ones previously that take several weeks to take their effect, this one actually takes several months to take its effect. 
plus it's by injection only, plus these are really expensive. Those are the three big adverse um, concepts in using this drug, three big reasons why we wouldn't want to. It takes several months. They're very expensive and they're by injection only. That being said, for a great deal of the population, the ones that are using this, these do work really, really well. And this is where a lot of patients find their ultimate relief in battling rheumatoid arthritis. Next, we're gonna move on to gout, which is another type of arthritis. And over here, we have a few different medications. First, we have colchicine. Colchicine has been around for a really long time. It is used for gout. It's used for both prevention and treatment of gout. And depending what's going on with the patient, what medication we're going to use. Please note that colchicine is used both for prevention and acute uh, treatment of gout. However, when it's used for tr acute treatment of gout, it should really only be used in the first few, let's say 36 hours of onset of symptoms. After that, it's not as effective as some other agents. However, if given within that first uh, window, it is a really effective agent for this disease and it is often preferred for that. However, if we're outside that window, most of the time we have to move on to something else such as steroids. Also for gout, we can use um, NSAIDs just like we could for RA as a first line treatment. And also we can use steroids. Again, generally speaking, if you can use NSAIDs, you can use steroids. Steroids are a much, much stronger version of NSAIDs. And along with that, they have a lot more adverse effects as we discussed in previous lectures. Please note, in addition to colchicine, steroids, and NSAIDs for the treatment of acute gout, we can also inject the steroid into the specific area that is affected with gout, where they have their, their gout flare up. Stereotypically, that would be at the joint at the base of the big toe. However, if a provider is not proficient in that, that may not be an option, in which case we would go to an oral or systemic course of steroids. If a patient is having an acute gout attack, we just said they can get injected steroids, oral steroids, NSAIDs, or colchicine. If we want to prevent them from getting gout flare-ups in the first place, we have a few options. We already said colchicine is used for both prevention and acute treatment, so that's one of them. And then we have the next two options. The next one is xanthine oxidase inhibitors, also known as allopurinol. The mechanism of action here is that it reduces your uric acid levels. And again, we said at the top of this lecture that it increased uric and uric crystals in the blood is what causes this in the first place. The indication for this, again, is gout prevention. And this medication is actually also used for nephrolithiasis. The onset of this drug is several days, but its full effects don't kick in for several weeks. It is noteworthy and interesting that patients that have an, a, a history of gout may actually um, get worsened their gout when they first start taking this as opposed to longer term. This does work long term for the treatment, for, I'm sorry, for the prevention of gout. It is not for the treatment of acute gout. Same thing with the next class, that's uricosiurix, and the drug here is probenicid. This medication also reduces your uric acid level. It is only used for gout. And once again, we have the same thing that it does take um, a few days to a few weeks to fully kick in. It is also only used for prevention, not acute treatment. And again, it may exacerbate your gout upon initial initiation of pharmacotherapy. Moving on to the next disease, we're gonna talk about osteoporosis and the first line drug here are the bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates is a drug class and this is considered first line. Drugs here are landronate, um, or we have another one, zoldronate. That one is by IV only. And these medications decrease bone turnover, thereby increasing the strength of your bone. What do we use it for? As we said, osteoporosis, Paget disease as well. Um, this medication is teratogenic, similar to birth control. This medication is teratogenic. And a patient education here is two interesting things that you may be tested on, especially at the nursing level, is a laundronate should be taken before the first full meal of the day with a full glass of water, and the patient should not lie down for at least 30 minutes following administration. You don't see that elsewhere very often, so that is noteworthy, and anything that's off like that is fair game for a test. Another medication that we have for the treatment of osteoporosis, this is specifically in postmenopausal women, are the SERMs, S-E-R-M, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators. This drug is raloxifene, and the mechanism of action is similar to estrogen. Because it's similar to estrogen, again, this medication is also teratogenic. And just like we learned previously about estrogen, 
it does carry an increased risk of a patient developing clots, especially if they're also a sedentary lifestyle and or they smoke. If a patient is taking this medication or the previous one, any treatment for osteoporosis, make sure they are getting enough intake of calcium vitamin D or encourage them to obtain supplements. Next, we have calcitonin, which is meant to bring down your calcium level. The mechanism of action is that it increases calcium excretion, that's through the kidneys, as well as decreases calcium loss from the bones, so the bones hold on to calcium instead of dumping them into our blood. The indications here are obviously going to be for hypercalcemia, but they're also used for osteoporosis because remember, it helps the bones hold on to calcium, which increases the strength of the bones, which is a problem in osteoporosis. It's also used to treat Paget's disease. That's another uh, bone disease. This medication is not taken orally. It's taken either parenterally or intranasally. Last thing we're going to do here is talk about a few miscellaneous drugs that we have not had the opportunity to discuss in other portions of this lecture series. However, before I get to it, really quick, since you're still here, hopefully watching, enjoying this final lecture in the series, please go ahead if you haven't already and subscribe to our channel. This channel does not um, take, uh, require money or anything else, but we do ask that you go ahead and subscribe. So let's move on to a few random drugs. We're gonna start with pregabalin. The brand name for this is probably pretty popularly known and that is Lyrica. And this medication has a relatively complicated mechanism of action, but it's used for fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain, and actually for seizures as well. It even has some off-label uses such as restless leg syndrome and anxiety. There's not a whole lot more that we're gonna go into with that one specifically. You may see it depending on your curriculum covered during the seizure medications. However, we didn't do that because we were focusing on the top seizure drugs. So we do wanna throw it in here because you may see it. It's actually more commonly used, I believe, for fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain than it is for seizures. The next drug we have here is disulfram. You may have heard this term brought up several times, but we never actually covered this medication. And it blocks the oxidation of alcohol. Well, what does that mean? That means that it makes it that if you take alcohol while on disulfram, you are going to get incredibly sick. You're gonna get symptoms such as headache, flushing, nausea, vomiting, weakness, syncope, and the list goes on and on. So, concept behind this drug is if the patient takes this pill every single day, it does nothing until they consume even one drop of alcohol. If a patient takes this pill every day and then decides that they want to have a drink of alcohol and they take it, they're going to get extremely sick. So it's meant to be a deterrence. Keep in mind, it only works if the patient is voluntarily and knowingly taking this medication every day, as it serves as an extra barrier not to go ahead and have that drink because of all the adverse effects you're going to have specifically while taking this medication. It is never to be slipped into a patient's beverage or food without them knowing. It does require voluntary consent. You do need to educate your patient that if they decide that they want to stop taking this because they want to have a drink, it doesn't work that I'll stop taking it this morning so tonight I can go out with my friends and have a few drinks. No way. This lasts in your system, I believe it's roughly seven days. So they have to wait at least a week after this drug has taken its, after they've taken their last dose before they go ahead and try to consume any alcohol unless they want to get these really bad effects. This does have a black box warning that this must be given to the patient knowingly and voluntarily and not forced on the patient or given to them unknowingly. Another drug that we also have for alcohol use disorder is naltrexone, not to be confused with naloxone. Naltrexone is also an opioid antagonist, just like naloxone but this is used to treat alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder. Before starting this drug, the patient has to be drug free for at least a week or two. And this medication can be taken daily or monthly. And it's meant to help patients who are addicted to narcotics or who are dependent on alcohol to get off of it. Again, the patient must be off of alcohol or opioids prior to initiating this, but this is meant to help them get through um, the process of coming off of their dependency or addiction. Next, we have a prostaglandin analog. And this medication is used for ocular, which is your eyes, ocular hypertension, and open angle glaucoma. I don't think you'd be tested on the mechanism of action here. This is a pretty one-off drug, but I did want to include it in here because it could easily be in one of your curriculums. Um, this medication is given via the ophthalmic route. It's the only drug that we've talked about so far that is given via the ophthalmic route. And it does have some side effects that it can cause eye pain or blurry vision. 
keep in mind for this indication for a patient that has um, some eye pathologies such as uh, ocular hypertension, they may also be treated with beta blocker eye drops such as Timolol. Timolol, remember LOL drugs are the beta blockers. Timolol is a commonly used eye drop also for this same indication. And finally, the last drug we're gonna talk about in this entire series is the tretinoin. The mechanism of action here is meant that it helps reduce acne. The symptom of acne, that development on the skin is that word over there. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but a condones. And those are prevented with this medication. What is it used for? It's used to treat acne. The full name is acne vulgaris. It is applied topically, um, usually um, once or up to twice a day. It can be taken with some other acne medications, such as benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid. Um, this may be sometimes referred to in the drug class of vitamin A. I've looked at several different textbooks. Some of them have it there, some of them don't, but just an FYI. And again, this medication is taken for acne. You made it to the end of the lecture series. Hopefully you learned a ton of farm and are now comfortable with it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.